We have with us in the studio today Dr. Josh Dines from the Hospital for Special Surgery, and we'll be discussing Achilles tendon ruptures. Josh, thank you for joining us today. Chris, thanks for having me. Absolutely. Now, you're a sports medicine surgeon with a very busy practice. Now, most of us, when we think of a sports medicine surgeon, we're thinking of shoulder injuries and knee injuries, but what about lower extremity injuries? Yeah, I mean, you, clearly the majority of my practice is shoulder surgery, knee, and some elbow, but a lot of ankle injuries kind of fall into the volition of sports. Achilles tendon ruptures, ankle stabilizations, ankle arthroscopy, a lot of these sort of injuries occur while playing sports. And from a patient perspective, they get injured playing a sport, they then have to kind of choose a doctor. Uh, and so in their mind, this becomes a sports medicine type injury. So while there's a lot of overlap with foot and ankle surgeons and, and distal extremity surgeons who treat these injuries, a lot of these patients get seen by sports medicine specialists. That makes a lot of sense. Now, there are a lot of Achilles tendon ruptures across the United States uh, every single year, and some surgeons are treating uh, these injuries non-operatively. What are your thoughts about non-operative versus operative intervention? Well, it's, it's a great question, and it's clearly an area of debate, and I think first and foremost, it depends on the patient's age and activity level. So, you know, clearly most people at this point would agree younger, more active athletic patients are going to benefit from surgical repair. There's a lower re-rupture rate, better return to strength, and along those lines, just a better return to sport. So it's interesting that you mention about the size of the incision, which has undergone a significant evolution. Uh, what are your thoughts about the open crack out versus a percutaneous repair? Well, I think, you know, look, at a lot of things in orthopedics, there's been a transition, and we've we started with big open incisions, and as our knowledge of sort of the anatomy and the biomechanics has improved, we've gotten a, a better implants, we've gotten sort of smaller in our incisions because it's just less morbidity to the body. But particularly as it relates to Achilles tendon repairs, we know that wound healing is such a big issue. And, you know, if you can get the wound to heal well, really, you know, the, the person is sort of in the clear after surgery. Um, and anything we can do to kind of improve wound healing or decrease the risk of wound dehiscence is a victory. So I think with that as the backdrop, getting away from these large incisions with open crack house and transitioning to more of these percutaneous, the PARS technique where it's a percutaneous Achilles repair system, um, doing this through percutaneous suture passing techniques really decreases the incision size, thereby decreasing the risk of wound breakdown and really kind of becomes a big benefit to our patients. Now, do you do many of these uh, repairs each year? Probably, you know, 10 to 15, you know, as a sports surgeon, but because these happen during sports, you know, basketball, tennis, pretty commonly. Um, athletes who I've treated will, will come to me or they, they think it's a sports injury. So there is, it really does, the lines blur between kind of a sports medicine specialist who treats a lot of these and the foot and ankle specialist or distal extremity specialist who treats a lot of these. So because of that, I end up you know, treating a fair amount of Achilles tendon ruptures. Now, do you think because the technology and the technique has evolved so much, do you think people will be treating more of these in the future? For instance, maybe they shied away from them because the big open incisions had a higher complication rate. Now with this percutaneous technique, uh, a lower complication rate and potentially a faster uh, return to work and to play. Do you think more of these are going to be done in the future? I think yes. I mean, I think for three reasons. One, people are staying more active, so they're probably going to be a higher incidence of Achilles tendon rupture. So the sheer number will probably increase. You mentioned a great point in terms of kind of more minimally invasive incisions. The more you can obviate one of the, the main complications from this procedure, the more likely surgeons are, are going to get a little more appropriately aggressive about fixing them. The other thing that I think is critical when we talk about Achilles tendon repairs is that some of the newer studies are, are getting more sophisticated in, in terms of looking at outcomes, looking at different strength measures that, that really were ignored previously that are really important in terms of the recovery. So as we get better with our outcome measures, I think we're realizing the benefits of surgical repair over non-operative treatment. And for that reason as well, we're going to start repairing these more frequently. Josh, you're a friend, and I know that you're an extremely active person, uh, enjoying uh, running, biking, playing tennis. Maybe you could explain what happened in late July. Yeah. So. Um, Either I'm getting old and I'm officially kind of a weekend warrior or I'm an elite athlete like Kobe Bryant or, or David Beckham, but I tore my Achilles playing tennis. Um, classic, you know, was running for ball, fell over, felt like I was hit in the back of the ankle. Mm -hmm. I thought I was hit by a ball from the other court, and when I rolled over and there was no ball, mm -hmm. I, I knew what that meant. So um, I was in denial for about three or four seconds, but then I knew my Achilles was torn. Oh, geez, it's horrible. Yeah. So interesting. So what was your rationale? Uh, to decide what was the best technique for you? Because, you know, we get it all the time and patients ask us, well, what if it was you? What would you do if it was you? Well, this is the perfect case. What would you do if it was you? Yeah, it's, it's a great point because I mean, that's the discussion I have with my patients all the time, whether it's an Achilles tendon rupture or a rotator cuff tear, and it's what would I do for me if it applied or what would I do for a family member? The first decision, as we've talked about earlier, is, you know, whether you treat this operatively or non-operatively. And for all the reasons I mentioned, you know, our techniques have gotten better. I want to be active. I want to be, you know, kind of have as low a re-rupture rate as possible. I want it to be as strong as possible so I can get back to playing the sports I like to play. Surgery became sort of an easy decision. 
once I decided on surgery, then the issue becomes, all right, how are you gonna fix this surgically? Mm -hmm. And you know, sort of the large incision, open crack out on both ends is not something I want because I am worried about wound healing. And for me, that then transitioned to using the PARS technique. Lastly, what are your thoughts about the technique evolving from the PARS, where you are tying knots, to the Achilles mid and speed bridge, where you're fixating it with swivel locks into the calcaneus? I think it's a great, you know, again, a lot of things, or things we see these techniques evolve. And you know, it's not to say one's necessarily better than the other. I think there's indications for both. So, um, you know, the, the knotless sort of speed bridge technique really gets rid of, you know, some of the issues that you have with the PARS, such as like a big, you know, potentially a, a, a large suture or knot stack. Mm -hmm. um, you don't have to worry about the sort of reproducibility of, of surgeons tying knots um, because it becomes a knotless construct. It also works really well when you're, you have a distal tear where there's not a lot of tendon left on the calcaneus and this becomes a great option. Mm -hmm. Now to be fair, this doesn't mean that the PARS technique is going away. I think there's still great uses for the PARS technique when you've got you know, more proximal tears. Mm -hmm. So I think as we go forward, I think there's a role for each of these um, and it really is gonna be sort of case by case dependent and also surgeon comfort level dependent. Thank you. Any final thoughts, Josh? No, I mean, first, thank you for having me. Mm -hmm. I think you know, talking about this just sort of echoes a lot of what we've seen in orthopedics in general, which is just technology making things better where we've gone from large open repairs, whether it's the rotator cuff or, or the Achilles, to sort of more minimally invasive techniques, whether it's arthroscopically in the rotator cuff to PARS techniques at, at the Achilles. Well, thank you, Josh. This has been a really interesting discussion. Chris, thanks so much.